Todas las grandes ideas son el resultado del deseo de cumplir los sueños. De encontrar respuestas a incógnitas que antes se creían indescifrables. Son fruto de la fascinación por lo desconocido. Y la pasión de mentes brillantes dispuestas a conquistar las estrellas. Las grandes ideas son la huella indeleble de la existencia de la humanidad. No es solo lo que haces por ti, es lo que haces por el futuro. Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana. Good morning uh, to all the audience in Colombia and Latin America. It's a pleasure to be with us this morning. Uh, I am Rafael Calles, the Head of International Affairs at the Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana in Bucaramanga, Colombia. And welcome to the fourth session of our Air Copa Lecture Series. Today, I will be guiding the event as moderators. So welcome to this new opportunity to share with us some insights about the SDGs. Mm, as you said, uh, this is an important project that the Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana is leading with the support of the University of Potsdam as part of the Higher Education Potsdam Columbia Partnership. And this is an, the EPCOP project uh, in the whole paragraph. It's a bilateral initiative developed jointly by Colombia and Germany, in which the University of Potsdam, Universidad de Caldas, Pontificia Universidad Javeriana Cali, Colombian Universities Association, SCUN, and Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana have worked together since 2019 to build up capacities in the areas of quality, digitalization, and management in higher education. So uh, today it's a new opportunity, as I said before, to know more about SDGs, and we'll have two important lecturers to participate during our plans. So uh, we'll be starting with the first lecture of this session. So let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Johan Lugensam. Uh, he's professor for energy politics at the University of Potsdam, and he also leads a research group regarding dynamics of energy transition. His research is centered around policies, strategies, and instruments that add the change to a completely renewable energy system. And also his focus lies on the interaction between different political interests and goals. His work is supported by the European Research Council. So, Professor Johan, thank you so much for being with us today, and welcome to the App Couple Lecture Series. Hi, thanks, Rafael. Thanks for uh, for inviting me and uh, introducing me. I will see if I can honor this by sharing the correct screen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is always the most difficult part of well, of anything really. <laughs> so, <laughs> does this appear to be the correct one to you? Yeah, that's working. Super. Okay, fantastic. So first hurdle has been managed. That's that's super good. So uh, well, thank you for 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 inviting me. I was invited here today to talk about uh, the kind of research that we do, and specifically um, the path to zero emissions in the energy sector. How how are we going to decarbonize the energy sector in Germany, in Europe, in Colombia, in Latin America, in the world? Um, all, and all together, and in particular, how can science help to, to do this? What can we learn from, let's say, objective science on, on, on finding out how to do these things? And this is, of course, a pretty difficult task because there are more, more or less, uh, let's say, uncontroversial statements from natural science about the climate side of these things, why we need to decarbonize, how far we need to decarbonize, and so on. But when it comes to the solutions, as we shall see, there are conflicting views on how we can do this, and I hope to show what these conflicting views are and which of these I believe is the best one and, and why that could be. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to approach this from a sustainability transition policy perspective, from the field of transition studies, which is an interdisciplinary research field, but specifically looking at the policies for, for how we can do this. So if we think about this term, sustainability transition policy, which is an, an emerging research field uh, particularly in Europe, but increasingly also on, on the other side of the northern and, and also on the southern side of the Atlantic. We see that this sustainability transition term consists essentially of two different things. On the one hand, we have the term sustainability transition, which describes the kind of challenge that we're dealing with here. We're talking about change, systemically changing, we're talking about changing entire systems in a deliberate way. It's vision driven. We need to change from the system that we have today 
to some other system that we can only imagine today how it will look. But we need to move step by step towards this vision, towards this deliberately set aim. That's what a sustainability transition is about. Going from the today system that is unsustainable to the future system that is then hopefully environmentally friendly and durable for, for the long run. The second part of this term looks into transition policy, and that's easier to define because this is the, all the measures that governments need to implement uh, in order to achieve this envisioned future that we want to deliberately reach into the future. So if we look at these two different terms, they are, let's say, differently contested. So on the one hand, this sustainability transition, where we need to go, what is the vision, what is the end state of, of, of a sustainable energy system that we would need to approach, there we can rely on natural science to a relatively large extent. Because here are some, some completely uncontroversial things. We know that our, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is increasing. And we know that the temperature is increasing. And we know that the main driver for these increasing temperatures is the increasing CO2, temp uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. This is, this is known. This is, this is not, not in the least controversial. We also know that the temperature reacts more or less linearly to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere, which means that if we set a target of whatever temperature increase, we have, of course, in the Paris Agreement set a two degrees target, there's going to be a carbon budget attached to that, an amount of carbon that we can emit into the atmosphere before some particular temperature target has been reached. So this is an example taken from today from our friends at the, the Mercator Institute in Berlin. They say at the current speed of emissions, the world has 24 years and five months left before we have met the carbon budget that is permissible under the two degree scenario. And after that, we have no chance of reaching the two degrees target at all. So these are things that, that natural science can tell us. They can help us define the future, the, the needs of the future, the place that we need to go to in the future. And this has been transposed politically into the Paris Agreement, which has set these targets of limiting global warming to two degrees or preferably even one and a half degrees above pre-industrial times. And <clears throat> what these things taken together mean, right? the observations of CO2 concentrations, of temperature, and this realization of the carbon budget combined with the political target of, of the two degrees, the two degrees target, means that over the long or short term, at probably sometime around mid-century, the Mercator Institute says in 25 years, we need to have reduced our emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to net zero. And, and this zero is, is something new. Before, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we thought, well, maybe it's enough if we reduce our emissions by, I don't know, 50% or 75% or 80% by mid-century. But now we know we actually need to reduce net emissions by 100%. We need to go to zero. That means that we really need to change the system completely. We need to somehow fundamentally change the way we can produce and consume energy. And that then leads to the question of how are we going to do that? The second part of the sustainability transition term, the, the measures, what are we going to do? How are governments going to achieve this target? And here, there's a lot less clarity, let's say, than on the natural science side of things. If we turn to policies, certainly in Europe, but I would argue around the world, really, we see that carbon pricing is the dominant climate policy proposal. We need to put a price on carbon emissions or people will not stop emitting carbon or they will not adjust their, their, their production use, their production processes, they will not adjust their, their consumption patterns. So in the German context, for example, the, the German Council of Economic Experts advising the government says that the Paris Climate Agreement targets require effective and efficient implementation and a global price on, green, on greenhouse gas emissions. So they even say not only could we have a carbon price, they say we must have one and that price must be global, so spanning all countries and all sectors in the world. If we look a little bit closer to actual policy making, for example, what the European Commission is in increasing or um, what they are proposing at the time, they're proposing a whole bunch of new climate policies as we speak for them, updated and more ambitious climate targets that we have decided here um, in Europe. And if we look closer on these measures, they are essentially EU ETS, this is emission trading, that is carbon pricing. The market stability reserve, that is an instrument to fix the emission trading scheme, to fix carbon pricing, and so on. It's carbon pricing, it's carbon pricing, it is carbon pricing. So we see where we will look when we look at climate policies and how we're going to manage this transition, we see carbon pricing. And 
some colleagues and I looked at the evidence of existing carbon pricing schemes from around the world to say, well, I mean, if we're going to rely on carbon pricing, then we must know how well does this instrument work? What are the types of effects that we trigger by that? And one of the very surprising things that we found was that carbon pricing has existed for 30 years, but there's only very little empirical evidence of the effects that it has at all. This We found 29 articles. Well, I'm aware of two more that have been published since our paper was done, but it's really little evidence of that. And if we turn to the evidence that we have, don't worry, I will talk you through this in a, in a useful way, hopefully. We see that it's a little bit bleak. So if we look at the two effects that are most important for a climate policy, looking at emissions and looking at the types of investments that this policy improves, we see that there's, let's say, mixed evidence for one and bleak evidence for the other. In terms of emissions, we see that emission trading schemes, the EU ETS and carbon taxes in different places of the world have sometimes been shown to have some effects, sometimes been shown to have relatively large effects, but it's a little bit a mixed picture. And in the schemes that where we have can identify that they have had relatively strong effects, this would, for example, be the carbon tax in British Columbia, this would be the carbon tax in Sweden, that are also among the highest in the world. We see that they have reduced emissions, that we can, we can really measure the effects of this. Um, and the reason why they have reduced emissions is in all cases, or only, almost all cases, operational shifts. It means that they have triggered an effect within existing fleets. We have because of the carbon priced uh, in countries that have a coal power fleet and a gas power fleet, we see that these countries use their coal power a little bit less and their gas power a little bit more. And because gas power is less carbon intensive than coal, then that reduces um, emissions. We also see some investments in improved efficiency, so insulation of houses, better boilers and in industry facilities and such things. But what we see is that this doesn't really change the structure. The emissions decrease, but it doesn't really change the structure of the energy system that we have. And for that, we would need to have zero carbon investment. Only with zero carbon investment can we, in the long run, reach a zero carbon energy system. And here we see that, first of all, there's very little evidence for zero carbon investments effect of these types of schemes at all. There's no evidence that this type of scheme has had zero, has triggered zero carbon investments at all. And all the evidence there is suggests that the carbon pricing has so far not triggered any investments in zero carbon technologies in reality. They do so in economic models, but they have not been shown to do so in reality. Now, this, of course, then raises some controversy uh, with economists in particular, and people will complain about our paper. Many people have complained about our papers as well, saying, yeah, sure, but the reason why there have been no effects is because prices have been too low. And this is the stand where we are now. We're discussing this. Is that really true or not? And I just want to raise the question if we look at how high carbon prices actually are. This is a collection of the carbon prices in all countries that have a carbon tax in the world. At the moment, the blue bar is the initial tax that they had and the yellow bar, um, the orange bar is the price that they had at the moment. We see that the evidence that we have collected or, or found in the literature is only from these high price countries that do not really have a very low carbon price. But of course, sometimes the prices in the investigated periods in our review were not particularly high, meaning that there is some truth to this. The prices that were investigated in our review were something about 13 to 40 euros per ton in most cases, and in some cases like Sweden, the prices were considerably higher. But it's a question, it's a matter of discussion, whether the low price is one of the reasons why the effects of, of carbon pricing have been very low in the past. I would guess that it is a part of the explanation. But in the second part of my talk, I will also argue now that this is not really the whole reason. We have big reason to believe that there are more fundamental problems with this carbon pricing instrument that stand in the way. So what we have in, in climate policy is essentially a conflict between two different types um, of, of two different mental models, you could say. On the one hand, we have the neoclassical model that we most of us have probably seen in school, maybe at university as well, where we have, uh, we have supply of things, uh, a rising cost curve, and we have uh, a demand curve that uh, with the utility or the price, the value of these products decrease uh, with, the, with the amount that we consume. These lines intersect. 
at some point. And if the market is left to itself and is undisturbed, the market will self-correct back to this equilibrium point. And we get this invisible hand of the market that clears the market at the point of the intersection point of these two lines. But as I said, there can be many different types of interferences in the market. And one type of interference or one type of disturbance in the market could be that there is a so-called externality, that there is something that happens in this system that causes costs that are not priced in, that no one really carries the cost of that, but the society as a whole carries that cost. And carbon emissions is one such thing, right? We, in most countries, we don't pay for carbon emissions, but these carbon emissions cause damages to all of society through the heating effect that they, that they create. So then economists will tell us, well, what we need to do then is to put a carbon price on that, on, on production, for example, and that will then, uh, we have this carbon price that will raise the supply costs, that will raise the production costs of things, and the market will then self-correct back to a new equilibrium point where we have an adapted production, for perhaps less production of something or a more efficient production of something, and meaning that we have less emissions. And we continue to do this. We start with a relatively low carbon price, and then we increase the carbon price until the desired emission level has been achieved. This is the mental model that stands behind the carbon pricing stuff. But then there is also the other, another one that is looks more at the dynamic effects of, of, of how systems change and how, the, how our economy change coming from evolutionary economics. And this looks the same, but if you look carefully, you see that the curves slope in backwards directions. In this model, we have falling supply costs over time because as we produce more of a, of a good, we learn better how to do it. We increase efficiency in our factories. The supply chains become better. The products become better so that they become cheaper over time, the more of the, of the thing that we have conserved, that we have produced in the past. And we see a rising utility of demand, meaning that the more of something that we consume, the higher is the value of consuming yet another uh, unit of that. And this happens when we adapt the system around things, when we adapt the networks and we adapt the regulations and institutions that, that happen around uh, around our technologies. So a first observation from that is that in the, evolu in the neoclassical model, we have increasing supply costs and we have a low carbon price that then increases over time in order to trigger the type of systemic, systemic change effects that we would want. Whereas in the other, the evolutionary model, we see something that we can actually observe in reality. For example, for renewables, we see that renewables used to be very expensive in the past and they have become very much cheaper, possibly the cheapest electricity technology that we have today. So we have very different dynamics on how technologies get into the market and how systems change in this type, in, in these two different mental models. And the evolutionary model leads us to completely different policy tasks than the than the uh, neoclassical model. Because what we need to do here is to first say, well, we want to transform this particular sector. We want to transform this particular system and we want to use a specific technology. We want to use electric cars, for example. Then we must make sure that we get electric cars so that they are built, so that there are new factories, that there is incremental innovation going on and the costs of these new technologies decrease, just as we can see that they have been going down, for example, with renewable energies in the past. Once these costs are starting to come down, we need to start thinking about how do we adapt the system? How do we build the infrastructure that supports these new technologies? How do we make the regulations that support them, the market designs, the standards or the norms that, that somehow govern this system? And if we adapt these to that, we will get this rising demand curve and we will push through to across this threshold system and we will manage to do the transition. So we have this conflict between these two different models. On the one hand, we have the neoclassical world, which wants to optimize the system. And on the right hand side, we have the evolutionary world that wants to transform the system. So from, from a theoretical point of view, there is much reason to believe that the right hand side, the transformation system, uh, the transformation model is actually the best one if we want to have a, a full transition going, for example, to full decarbonization. And if we look historically, this is exactly how different how past transitions have happened. We see, for example, when we wanted to have cars in, in the past, right? Cars didn't just break through because the technology came, but cars broke through because the technology came and people started buying these new cars. Here's the Model T, for example. And as soon as people started buying these Model T, there was tremendous innovation in the manufacturing stage in particular to make these cars better, to make them more reliable, and also to make them cheaper. So that the cost of this car came down by something like 75% over the first 20 years 
of its production. And this is the type of learning curve. This is exactly the same type of learning curve that we also see for, for renewables. And we see them for all kinds of, of new technologies, all types of new technology, uh, high tech technologies that we want to put in the market. But getting the first cars on the ground and getting these cars to become cheaper was not sufficient because cars couldn't eat oats like the horses that we had in these days did. So in order for these cars to really start to play out their advantages, we needed to also have a gasoline refueling system. And in the 1910s and 1920s, countries across in particular the Western world or the global north, as we call it today, started building out these, these big gasoline supply networks so that cars could drive between cities, drive across countries, across very long distances, thus being really better than the horse, which was just not able to do so. We started to pave roads and make them flatter and harder. We started building highway systems. And with that, cars could really play out their advantages and because they were faster than the horses. So with these two innovations on the infrastructure side and with the deployment of these two new infrastructures, the cars could really start to play out and become better, show that they were better and more attractive than the horse. But that, of course, didn't solve all problems. We also needed to start thinking about how do we regulate this system? As the number of cars grew, we needed to regulate who can drive when. We needed to invent the traffic light. We needed to invent traffic laws. We needed to define where can you park your car and where do you can you only drive your car so that the parked cars don't stand in the way of the, of the driving cars and so on. And as cars started to take over, we got new norms arising, for example, that you need to have a car. A real man has a car, for example. We learned how fast should a travel be. We should travel at least 100 kilometers an hour, otherwise it's slow. We've got norms about how long should you be able to drive with a car, 100 kilometers, 500 kilometers or whatever. And these are, of course, norms that now are important for the transition to electric vehicles as well. So we see that the transition to cars, and we could see the same, I could tell the same story for all kinds of, of other transitions, happen due to a complex interplay between technology, where the key is to first get deployment so that we can improve the cost and performance of these technologies, but we also need, and this is the key to the transition happening, we need new infrastructure that allows the new technology to really play out its advantages. And as that happens, we also need to get new institutions and norms that support the new technology and allows it to really break through. So what we see then is that for a sustainability transition to happen, we need sustainability transition policy. So if we come back to the beginning, sustainability transitions in the energy sector are really about full sectoral decarbonization for each energy sector, for electricity, for heat, for cooling, for transport, for industry, and so on. They will have different challenges, each of these sectors, and hence we need different policies for each of these sectors. And for each specific sector, transition policy means that we need a sequence of sectoral policies addressing the actual barriers that stand in the way of this transition in, in reality, in the context that we are particularly in at the moment. So I want to just close this by, by bringing an example of what sustainability transition policy means if we really break it down into, into chunks and into these stages, what's the sequence of transition, sustainability transition policies that I just spoke about could mean. It means that in order to get a sustainability transition to happen at all, we first need new technology. We need invention. We need people who invent new cool stuff. Here's uh, some, some guy who has apparently developed a, a PV array, for example. And many people do this. Companies do this to, in, all, in order to develop new technologies and in particular better technologies. So the, the technologies that we are interested in here are better in the sense that they are cleaner, that they actually lead us on to this zero carbon future. The policy measures that we will need at this stage are research and development funding in particular. Once we have the technologies, once they exist, we need to bring them from the lab onto the market. We need market introduction policies, such as subsidy schemes. They can be public procurement programs and so on. And the aim of market introduction is to get investment and the first deployment so that we can go through the cost reductions that we need, that we have seen for the Model T Ford, for example, that we have seen for PV, that we have seen for wind power, and that we're presently seeing for electric vehicles. But that's not enough. Once we have these technologies and they are starting to become good and affordable, we need to go into the third stage, to the diffusion stage, to the mass diffusion stage of these new technologies. Here, we want a rapid and consistent expansion of these new technologies, leading to displacement of all the old stuff. And in this stage, which is where we are in electricity, at least in Europe, 
we are going to see policy measures that mean we need decreasing support. Possibly we don't need any support at all. Possibly we need to tighten standards so that we actually get rid of coal power and so on. But what we in particular need at this stage is infrastructure adaptation so as to support the needs of these new technologies and allow them to play out their advantages. And we need to start seeing first the institutional reforms of fixing regulations, of fixing the, tie, the way the system is organized in order to support these new technologies. And the ultimate aim of all of this stuff comes in the last stage, the stabilization phase, where the new technologies that we picked possibly decades before have achieved market dominance. They have created a new normal. They, they, they are the system. They are what is there, right? They are not strange anymore. They don't need to be supported anymore. They are just there and have become the way that we produce electricity or heat or the way we transport ourselves around our cities and countries. And at this particular stage, policies will often not be perceived as policies. They will be regulations of what you are and what you are not allowed to do. Just as we don't question where you're allowed to park and where you're not allowed to park today, 150 years ago or 100 years ago, that was pretty controversial. And in the future, it will be the same. Of course, we will have standards that say you're not allowed to build a coal power station. Why should you? They're very dirty. You will need standards, you will need possibly need bans on the old technologies if they haven't died by themselves, and you will need different types of other funds, maybe social programs to cushion the effects of the other declining elements. So this is in a nutshell on this slide, I think, which <laughs> with an admittedly hasty and, and hopefully not too confusing presentation. Um, this is what sustainability transition policy tells us. Climate science tells us where we need to go. But if we follow this type, this style of recipe for designing our policies in a sequential manner, sector by sector, then this is what we can learn about how to design our frameworks to get to these zero carbon futures in a reasonable time, perhaps by mid-century. Thank you. Professor Johan, thank you so much for your participation and for this interesting lecture. It's incredible to know how important this topic around CO2 emissions it's doing and also it, it's going well because it's like now a responsibility from different point of views as you said before companies uh, probably social and, and civil organizations and also the academy uh, we're all around uh, a common objective and also milestone and let's try to, to be more sustainable and that it's one of our points during this lecture series talking about how the SDGs uh, in this paragraph and, and medium term for 2030 uh, could be achieved at more as, a, as it will be possible. So that's a, a, a very good point. We have some questions uh, in the in the YouTube chat, Professor Johan. So the first one is from the Seccional Santanderes and said, do companies today need to reduce their CO2 emissions to be socially responsible? Well, <clears throat> I guess that's that's a normative question. It's hard it's hard to, to give a give a definite answer on that. I believe that companies are well advised to think about ways to reduce their emissions and to eliminate their emissions. How are they going to live in a zero carbon world for competitiveness reasons? This is one of the ways that they can ensure that they actually exist in the future. And that's things that these are things that companies very much need to consider. Who is is not socially responsible, I think is a is, is, is a difficult question to answer. And it's it's not always a super constructive question to ask because it puts quite a lot of blame. So I would I would rather go go the other way around and see what are the opportunities, what are the chances for companies on the one hand to generate new growth within their within their organizations, but at least also to deflect harm. How can they decarbonize in order to stay in business also in the long run? Thank you. We have a second one, Professor, and I think that it's from a, an environmental engineering student from the UPB here in Bucaramanga. And he's asking about what is your advice for environmental engineering students about which topics need to be explored now in formal research, probably like in tendencies or, or some recommendations for research. OK, well, I mean, this this would be I mean, uh, this would then probably be on the particularly on the first two stages of, of transition so i mean where we really need technological development right let's say basic research are for example in in the industry sector and in heat sectors and in high temperature heat sectors i i myself i'm, I'm a big fan of, of new uh, 
liquid fuel technologies, for example, solar fuel, how can you make liquid fuels, which are super attractive fuels because they are so energy dense that they actually they're important and they were going to be important for, for example, future aviation. They are very far away from market readiness. We have some avenues for how to, how we could possibly do this, but we really don't know which of these re, which of these technological routes will work. That type of, of, of technological setting where you really think where are the biggest, where are the hardest nuts to crack in the future? And I would think they are in the liquid fuel segment. They are in energy storage, both electricity, but in particular also heat. How can we store heat, high temperature heat, and how can we do that over longer periods of time so that we, especially in, in, in the far north and in the far south of, of the world, can bridge the gap from winter to summer? Because we have, we have a problem with that. I would go for things like that, but I'm sure that there are also very specific processes in industry that need to be decarbonized that, that, that I, as, a, as, as an electricity wonk, am, am not particularly knowledgeable about so far. But steel, plastics, cement, they also need to go and they are very far away from market maturity. All that points looking for more sustainability also in the energy transition. Thank you, Professor. Yes. And that's uh, another one question in the YouTube chat from Frederick. Uh, who said, is the current so-called energy crisis an opportunity or rather a threat to change? For example, longer use of coal for power generation. Oh, I think, this is, uh, I, th I think the jury is still out on this. <laughs> I, my, my, my view on this is that the current crisis is going to be supportive of the energy transition in the medium term because the, the climate crisis or the Right? requiring this expansion of renewables, insulation of houses, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it has the same solution as the gas crisis. So in the short term, of course, there are problems, because especially in, in Europe, we spend a lot of money, like Trump, just copious amounts of money to, to avert the, the most horrible effects, the most horrible economic effects of this. And that money is, of course, lost for, for more useful investment investments in, instead. But in the long run, we need to get out of the predicament as well. We cannot just patch it and put on band-aids and stuff, especially not if they cost hundreds of billions of euros. So there we need to do the same things. We need to deploy wind power. We need to deploy solar power. We need to do something about our houses. We need to insulate them. We need to build heat pumps and so on and so forth. So they have the same solution. And it's easy to somehow ignore climate change or to postpone climate policy to next year because we have some other priority at this time. Right? And we've done so in the past. But with this gas crisis that we're having now, we cannot postpone it. It is extremely large, this crisis, and it is extremely immediate. So there is no postponement. So I think starting in, in, a, in, the, mid, in the midterm, starting in a couple of years and from 20, up to 2030, 2040, I think the energy crisis will be accelerating the energy transition and not stopping it. It doesn't mean that it will be easy, but they will be mutually supportive. Thank you, Professor. And the last one is from Ethereum. Uh, he's asking about, I would like to know how do you evaluate the current activities of climate activists in Germany? Do you think it will have a positive impact on the climate issue in terms of policy making? I mean, the climate activists in Germany, they are very much in the, in the media at the moment because they are throwing mashed potatoes at Van Gogh paintings and they are gluing themselves to streets and blocking traffic. And there was a big event in, in Berlin last week where a bike rider was hit by a cement truck and she died eventually. And uh, these demonstrators, these activists, apparently blocked the highway so that the fire department arrived later than they would have otherwise. Um, whether that is what triggered her death, I think that is uh, out for discussion. I think the concrete car is what killed her, but, 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 but nevertheless. So there is a big discussion about these things. I think there are two answers to, to, to give to this question. Um, I mean, whether or not this raises attention for climate issues is, I think it does raise attention for climate issues because it shows that, that there are many people out there, there are many young people out there who are very desperate about it, who are very serious about it. And are, are, they are putting climate change on the agenda every now and then, even though it is to a large extent negative attention that they are attracting. Um, but then, <clears throat> I mean, in, in, in the end, what we also see is that conservative 
politicians, conservative, the conservative spectrum of, of society is also using this to put blame on them. You cannot destroy these paintings and, and they don't destroy them because they are protected by glass so that mashed potatoes don't actually reach them. You cannot stop traffic because look at this, how, how horrible with this fire truck. And they are using this as an argument to stop, to discredit the whole climate movement, to discredit climate policy as well and, and, and as a proxy. And I think that is a little bit dangerous actually. So I would, <laughs> my personal advice, but this is advice and not at all just based on my on my research, but just my, my observations, I would tone it down a little bit. Because if we're going to manage this full decarbonization, this full transition, we also need the conservative half of society. We cannot alienate them just because we see ourselves as being right on the left and on the green side of, of society. We need everybody to pull along. And for that, we cannot be too dramatic and too radical in our expressions because we may alienate the people that we need. That's uh, a good point and an excellent final message, Professor Johan. Uh, I am totally agree. If we are trying to do and um, if, if each one of, of us has the opportunity to, to know more and also to, to make some impact with different actions in terms of transition of energy and also trying to be an example probably in our families or in our academy and universities in each one of the of the environments in which we are participating also we have more push also more opportunities to know the benefits of the energy transition also to the to the general population so professor johan thank you so much for being with us uh, it's always a, a pleasure to have you here uh, as a, a usual lecturer into a couple lecture series and thank you so much for your approach about this internship topic and, and also all the best for your future research and also approaches in these interesting topics. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So see you next year, I hope. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Well, after the presentation of the Dr. Johan Williamstam, um, we are ready now to go for our second lecturer of today. Um, at this point, let me introduce you to Professor Dr. Hans Henning von Gumber. Professor von Gumber holds since April 2021 the Professorship for Knowledge and Technology Transfer at the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences at the University of Potsdam. Prior to that, he was the president of the Niederhin University of Applied Sciences and served two presidential terms. Also, Professor von Gumber also served as a professor of physical chemistry at the University of Graz in Austria. Also in 2017, he was named University Manager of the Year by the weekly newspaper Zit at the Center for Higher Education Development, CHE. So it's a pleasure as well to have Professor Von Gumber here with us. Professor, uh, welcome and thank you so much for being with us in the Epco Collector Series. Thank you very much. Good morning to you and good afternoon to, to the rest of us. Um, can you call up my presentation, please? Yes, of course. Give me a minute and I will be in the background, but let me know if you can see the presentation yes. in, the, in the good side. Uh, no, we don't see it. Yes, now. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. So that is uh, my lecture, actually, Transfer and the Role of Science. What lessons could be learned from the SDGs? Um, uh, the SDGs will have effect on science in general. It will have effect on, on the research and the perspective of, of research, but it also will have an effect on the way a university is interacting with its environment, with economy and society. And that is all summarized with this word transfer. And so what I want to tell you about is what is the, what is the effect of the SDGs on knowledge transfer? And for that, um, the first thing is that I tell you a little bit about the third mission or the, the idea of knowledge transfer. And then I will ask what, what are the great uh, factors that uh, will change these third mission of university. Um, as you probably all know, there the, the, the word knowledge transfer or technology transfer is part of a broader context, is part of uh, these models, innovation models, and one of the most primitive models is the linear innovation model, where you start with a basic research and you um, all by, by, by itself, incidentally, so to speak, you, you make an invention while doing basic research, uh, and this uh, 
in, uh, invention is then fed in um, a next step into the applied research and then it is developed by some companies. So you transport that from the academic side, um, publicly funded academic side to the private sector, to firms and businesses. Please, can you do the next slide? Uh, the, and another slide? The next one, yes, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and um, so this uh, linear innovation model is basic research, applied research, then the technology transfer from the public side to the private side, and then the business or the company will do the development, will end up with a finished technological product, and then everything goes to the market. That is the linear innovation model in a nutshell, and it, of course, aims at commercializing research, the results of a research project, but the research itself is not aiming at uh, producing innovation, but the research is aiming at yes, fundamental knowledge. And it's a model that is outdated today. It's has never been empirically based, but it has dominated the science, technology, and innovation policy over years, over decades, actually. And please, next slide. And it's replaced by more sophisticated models um, that is not the, uh, the, the up-to-date model, it's, it's the triple helix model. We are now having the quadruple model and even the quintuple model. But this is a model that explains um, much more realistically, in a much more realistic way, how um, innovation is triggered and where innovation re uh, comes out of. The basic assumption is here that innovation emerges in the interaction of three different domains, science, economy, and the government. And it is a result of a dynamic exchange of, all the, of, act, of actors from all these three domains. And it is uh, happening uh, especially in the overlap region of all three domains. So science uh, must uh, do a research product that has some relevance to economy the economy must start to uh, be interested in scientific project, must start uh, being interested in, well, offering some problems to science that is interesting to the scientific domain. And the state at the same time has to organize funding in such a way that this interaction between science and economy is working. So all three systems overlap. And now a quotation with, from Etzkowitz and Leidersdorf with each taking the role of the other and with hybrid organizations emerging at the interface. Now, that is, the, that is um, a more sophisticated model of how innovation comes about. Please, next slide. Um, and if I offer you three uh, definitions of the third mission, um, then you will see how much uh, it has changed over the last two, 20 years. At the beginning of the 1990s, uh, the third mission or the knowledge transfer of a university was simply um, defined in such a way, generate profit for the university by means of commercializing academic knowledge. So that is a simple inside out perspective. Take your results from your university or from the research in your university and try to make money out of it. Um, and then later in the year 2005, when a more sophisticated, more intelligent model of the innovation process has, uh, has taken over, the, um, the idea was a slightly more um, complex. They said in, in, in perhaps 2005, the definition of knowledge transfer of the third mission is that, um, uh, that research mission hold potential value for external actors like firms, industry or society, and are brought to life through spin-outs, licenses, innovations, job creation, etc. So what the, in, in those days, what they thought is the university has not just research results, but many other um, options and, and many other offerings to society and tier economy, but still it's an inside out perspective on knowledge transfer. Um, and today, uh, the, the, the view on uh, third mission is on, on uh, transfer is universities represents an engine of knowledge creation for public purposes and is expected to interact with industrial partners, policymakers, and cluster organizations to create value for society. So the uh, underlying assumption is that university is not doing something by itself, but university is a 
public institution uh, uh, providing service to the public, to the society, and it has to deliver. So the first mission is teaching, the second mission is doing research, understanding something, and the third mission is to make these results, the outcome of a university, available to the broader audience, to the public, to the society. Now, what is the reason, next slide please, what is the reason for uh, this change? Why is it that, uh, that the university is now expected to be responsible for a third mission, for a third sector? Why is it that in, in former days it was enough to do teaching and learning, a teaching and research? Why is it that we now have to really bother about how to use our results? What is the reason for this process of rethinking science? And the first, and I think most important um, um, paper appeared in 1999. Next slide, please. Um, it was written by Michael Gibbons and it appeared in Nature in the December 1999. Michael Gibbons is a very famous researcher doing research on, well, yeah, history of science and science policy in um, Southampton. Um, and this paper and this article is, has the headline, Science, New Social Contract with Society. And let's... Uh, quickly look into the abstract of this article. Under the prevailing contract between science and society, science has been expected to produce reliable knowledge, but it merely that it communicates its discovery to society. So society gives money, expects some communication, um, but uh, universities are allowed, or science is allowed to work on whatever problem they like. But now the times change and a new contract must now ensure that uh, that it, that um, now ensure that scientific knowledge is socially robust and that its production is seen by society to be both transparent and participative. So a totally new attitude towards science. And this um, sentence uh, is very um, I have taken from this article, and it is very it, it put, brings the thing to the point. Not only can science speak to society as it has done over the past two centuries, but society can now speak back to science. And that is new. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, the society was like a stupid kid giving money and just listening to science and science to communicate whatever they like to communicate about. But society has grown up, so to speak, and is now able to um, really uh, speak back to science. And what do you think will they speak about? They will, of course, um, demand something, they will demand uh, research activities that have some societal impact. So uh, about uh, these years, it's this, this idea of societal impact, doing research with an impact, uh, that started, I think, with that paper in the late 90s, early uh, uh, 2000 years. Next uh, slide, please. Um, no, no, not that one. No, 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 other direction. Grad challenges. Yes, this one. Thank you. Grad challenges. Um, that was an another milestone in 2009. In 2009, um, we have seen, next slide, the Lund Declaration. And the Lund Declaration is really important to understand. And the summer 2009, researchers and research funders and business people and politicians have, um, have been gathered in Lund, uh, the Swedish uh, University Lund, to discuss uh, the future development of re European research. And the conference participants have agreed on a document, the Lund Declaration, that was then handed over to the Swedish Minister of Research. And the declaration states that the European research policy should move away from the present structure and instead focus on the grand challenges to the world. And that is, of course, climate change, water shortage, demography, and pandemics, and things like this. So you see that here, Europe must focus on the grand challenges of our time. And that is a milestone, because before that, uh, the, the academic side research has every freedom to work on problems they think interesting. 
So that is part of the academic freedom. But now you see that there is some public pressure on science to work in a specific direction and to contribute to the grand challenges of this time. And as a consequence of this document, the European funding strategy changed, the funding strategy of research and innovation. They, with the European Horizon program, the European supports excellent science, but more importantly, the European Union supports research following the mission connected to the SDGs and connected to the grand challenges of our time. Now, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and the, the, the third big factor was the, as the SDGs in 2015, um, where you have a number of um, goals that are only achievable if you do that by science. And next slide. And if you look, for instance, into this YouTube video from United Nations, science are our best bet to achieve the SDGs, then of course the answer is yes. It is not the best, it's the only way to achieve the SDGs. We have to change um, our behavior. We have just heard about the sustainability transition policy. That is clear. We have to have a procedure to do step by step. But of course, that must be led by science. And science has a pilot role in all this that is going to uh, be there in the future. Next slide, please. Um, and in order to prove that people have reacted, um, I, I want to look at the science policy. It's not about science. It is about the policy and the way of funding science and in the if you change the way of funding science you change science because the money is in some way at least guiding uh, the the the, uh, the science and next slide please and therefore i will have a look at the european research area policy agenda for the next couple of years next slide um, and that is very interesting. Uh, we have 20 different goals in the European Union that we want to achieve in the next couple of years. And these 20 goals are divided into four chapters. And the second chapter is the second priority area is taking up together the challenges posed by the twin green and digital transition and increasing society's participation in the European research area. And next slide, if you really look, next slide, please. And if you look at uh, the five um, goals connected to this priority area, then you see that the European Union is really doing the next step to change science in such a way that science is working on the grand challenges of our time. For instance, make European Union research and innovation missions and partnerships key contributor to the era. Uh, and European research area for green energy transformation 12. Accelerate the green digital transition of Europe's key industrial ecosystems or empower higher, edu higher education institutions to develop in line with the era and in synergy with the European education area. And the last goal, bring science closer to citizens. So you see that the European Union, at least, is really doing step towards changing um, the science policy. Next slide. And if you look at uh, this very, very uh, interesting UNESCO document, then you see that, um, well, that the framing of science has changed. Science is not only there to, to, uh, to gain fundamental knowledge, but science is of vital importance to respond to these challenges by providing solutions to improve human well-being, advance environmental sustainability, and respect for the planet's biological and cultural diversity. So, um, in a way, the system has reacted to our problems, has reacted already to the SDG. But what is more interesting is to see the discussion going on in the scientific community. And there are a number of authors that say that is not enough. We need more than that. That is just at the, at the surface of the problems. We need to have deeper transitions. Next slide. And that is... Um, this, um, uh, that is what I want to tell you at la in the last few slides. Um, I, I, that is probably only due to the SDGs, uh, that there are authors um, um, demanding a new framing for science and innovation policy that is aiming at a transformative change. Next slide. And I'm here, I'm referring to this article from Johann Schott and Edward Steinmüller, Three Frames for Innovation Policy, Research and Development, Systems of Innovation and Transformative Change. Next slide. And they start to, uh, to, to, to 
under, to, they, to, they start with the, um, um, by saying that our current innovation frames for science policy is not fit for addressing the environmental and social challenges uh, that, are, that are lying ahead of us. Quotation, we think that many technologies are deeply implicated in persisted, persistent environmental and social problems. So just providing new technic technological solutions to anything or new technologies is not enough. We, we must find a direction to develop technologies. Technologies cannot are not always or new technologies are not always um, a solution to our problems, but all too often part of the problem itself. Um, innovation policy in their current format may lead to economic growth because they are optimized to produce economic growth, but often exacerbate inequalities. But so it makes a difference if you optimize uh, technological innovations with respect to economic growth or if you optimize technological innovations with respect to SDGs. And therefore, they end the introduction with a um, with a sentence to meet the ambitious challenges expressed, for example, in the SDGs. We need a new framing for innovation policy aimed at transformative change. What do they mean by this word transformative change? And that is something that is very interesting. We argue that transformation of social technical systems is needed in energy, mobility, food, water, healthcare, communication, backbone systems of modern society. And this social technical system is totally different from simply a technological um, invention and technological innovation. It's not just a radical technological solution, but it's simply more than that. It's a network of solutions or network of reactions to one specific problem. What we call a social technical system transition, and now that defines what they mean, it implicates co-production of social, behavioral, and technological change in an interrelated way. Social technical system transformation or transition is about changing skills, infrastructures, industry structures, products, regulations, user preferences, and cultural predilections. And so what they mean is a radical change in all elements at the same time of the whole configuration, but not uh, singular events, not um, a technology here, a technology there, but a bunches of, of um, innovations that are uh, walking in the same direction and to the same effect. And with that, um, last slide, please. And with, oh, sorry, yeah, that, you have missed one. And now the last one. Okay, and that is my last uh, uh, slide. Um, what you see here is, I think, um, seven points which I think is important. Science is, of course, one of the best instruments to achieve the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. And the reason is very simple. So, uh, science can evolve quickly. Science is international. Science is used to cooperate in um, in large teams, so operate in a collaborative manner. And science is used to uh, face uh, shared problems. So if you want to solve a problem in science, you do it not alone, but uh, competing with other groups in the world. So this is uh, the perfect setting to solve the problems connected to the SDGs. Um, but what is needed is um, that we have to change the stimulus to science, the policy towards science, that is such that science is more organized in, um, in coherently and cooperatively work in the same direction. And that concerns the STG, so the science, technology, and innovation policies. That is now the major topic. Um, the third thing that is to be changed is that the gains and results of science must be distributed in a fair manner all over the world. If you think of the COVID, um, vaccines for COVID that was not distributed in a fair manner, that is now something that we have to work on. The fourth point is also important. Solutions suggested by science must be shared and applied everywhere. It's useless if it's just applied at one point. The fifth point is that science should switch a mode of organizing itself via missions. So either you can change science by giving money in a coherent way for one purpose, but you can also um, ask science to um, work according to missions. So a mission-driven science, and that should change really a lot. Um, what you want to have is that the strategy of universities, the strategy of academic institutions, but also the strategy of funding organizations must 
be um, summarized with a mission so that with a, that you know this university or this academic institution is working with all its research projects with all its transfer projects towards a common goal towards a mission and this mission of course must be aligned with the sdgs and the next point is that um Yes, that's what Judge just says. The mission must be designed such that they are consistent with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, and the last thing is, of course, we have to be more intelligent in the way we organize our teams. We must uh, have multi-stakeholder teams that are much larger than uh, there used to be. If we want to do a science that has some effect on people, we must include the people that are using all our knowledge. So the knowledge producer and the knowledge user must work together right from the beginning of a research project. And that is something that we need to change. And that was my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor, for this interesting presentation. I think that we need to highlight some interesting points that you mentioned it before. And I am totally agree about this perspective about collaboration, because it's totally important to collaborate if we are trying to achieve more results in terms of, of sustainability and also to achieve the SDGs. So probably from the Academy, uh, probably we will need to, to participate more with the external audiences and also uh, gaining more population to to interact with them also to transfer that knowledge and that science as you said before uh, like more equitative and, and also well distributed because in so many cases probably we are facing or also we are concentrating some information research or also knowledge in, in a specific populations but obviously we need to to try to be and to have a like a leave room to, to achieve the SDGs at the same point and, and also trying to, to gain more attention of these kind of topics. So we're ready to receive your questions in our YouTube chat. And I want to, to start with a question, uh, Professor Balgumber, uh, for example, from your point of view as, as a lecturer, but also uh, from your point of view as an, an academic uh, and, and also as, as professor in, in a transfer and also management lecturers and, and issues, what kind of advice can receive our students now uh, to try to do some research, but also to connect the practical side of the courses and the theoretical side of the courses into a practice to achieve SDGs. That's possible. Or do, you can recommend some some activities to, to put in mind and also in the practical point, that theoretical part? Well, my, my personal opinion is that we, we, we are doing enough of research. Research is by some way a, done automatically um, and we have a number of uh, institutions not doing research but what we are not so good at is to uh, to make something out of this um, research to really transform this research results into something into, an, into a new product into a new process so the conversion of our ideas into reality into the practice and that is something that we are trying to improve on uh, by at the university by working out new strategies how uh, everything that is thought in our university everything that is done in, in our university everything that is written down in the university is is handed over to people that are able to make something out of it. So it is that is something the new paradigm that that you must uh, as a researcher you must not say okay I have understood something I've written down it in a paper it's published anywhere and that's it I go home. No, uh, that is the moment where you have to organize the transfer bridge. You have to see how somebody else is using your results somewhere in the world and is making something out of it. And if I were a young student, I would start doing something, but not writing something. Writing papers is okay to make an academic career, but I can tell you in 10 or 20 years, um, it will not be so important how long your publication list is. It will be more important that you do a science that has some effect, that you do science that is contributing to the problems of our time. Thank you, Professor. That's totally right. And I am receiving a, a second question that is totally related with this, and it's about uh, the new framework that you mentioned it, uh, for science and also innovation, uh, like an effect of the SDGs. So th the question is, uh, what we need to pursue or, or what we need to, to follow up 
uh, to achieve a well integration between innovation and technology. Because as you said before, probably technology is in a level, but also the needs and the accomplishment of the SDGs is in another level. So how we can integrate at, at the best side the innovation with the also support and the innovation in terms of technology uh, to do a, a world transfer in the, in our audiences. Um, so this third frame of uh, Schott and Steinmüller, that is extremely exciting because they say, well, we have to, as a scientist, we're not only responsible for producing single resu research results and then perhaps single innovations, a product innovation, a process, and whatever, but we are also responsible for organizing teams such that we have a change of the transformation, that the technical system, the social technical system as such is changing. So we create or we, we, we are part of the Cre creative team working on this change as such and the transforma transformative change. It's, it's very, uh, very much um, related to what we heard before, the uh, sustainable transition policy. Uh, and that is not only a matter of the policy makers, because a policy, a politician can just give money, that's all, he cannot do it. But uh, the people that are able to do it are coming out of, of the universities. So we, as a university, must, must feel responsible not only to think about the future, but also to, to do something with our hands and, and to change it really. So being responsible for the transformative change. I think, I think that is an exciting new idea. And that is a total new, new field for science and uh, also for, for knowledge transfer. And I think it's the fourth dimension. Uh, first dimension teaching, second dimension research, third dimension transfer, but fourth dimension is creating and doing something about the transformative change. Thank you, Professor. That's an excellent point of view. And this is the, the, the last one question. And also it's related to the triple helix model that you explained it at the, at the start and also is connected with, with your last answer. So what we need to do as universities uh, to impact business and also a state and to be attractive to participate in that interaction? Say that again, sorry. Yeah, it's about the triple helix uh, model that you explained it. So mm -hmm. about also the, the comments and the suggestions that you explained before, what we can do as universities uh, in the institutional side to be attractive for business and also for the government to participate with us, for example, in international cooperation processes or to design actions together. So how we can be probably more attractive to, to participate with them? Yeah, okay. Uh, being more attractive to the economy, uh, it's simple. You must uh, try to, to come up with a more applied research that is having some relevance to the, to the economic field that you are interested in. Um, but uh, being uh, attractive to the politicians means making suggestions to the politics. What I have learned is politics is actually not be the first to think things, but uh, politics, the is very eager to pick up ideas that are invented somewhere else. So what science has to do, the universities has to do is go to the, your local politicians, go to your government and tell them, please change the funding in that and that and that way. So we as a scientist can have some influence on funding schemes, on funding organizations. And we must take up our responsibility to raise our voice and say funding in our times means that and that and that. So my idea is um, to be attractive, making suggestions to the politicians for them to make an attractive politics with respect to the SDGs and with respect to a funding policy uh, in accordance with the SDGs. Thank you, Professor. That's a good point. Also, it's connected with this comment in the YouTube chat from Jinjian Wan. Uh, who said that especially when it comes to international research cooperation, SDGs build a base of common understanding among all the partners. So yeah, it's like a, a common point of view. So thank you so much, Professor Bagumber, for being with us uh, today in our lecture series. I think that it's a, a totally interesting model also to adapt. Uh, we are also doing a lot of cooperation between Germany and Colombia. And, and one of the interesting points is that we have a lot to learn from your side, 
but also there are so many initiatives or probably insights in Colombia that also uh, can be interesting for, for the German institutions. So that's the, the plan. And also this inter-universities cooperation, it's also an opportunity and an action to, to be more attractive, to gain uh, also yeah. transfer actions and to achieve the SDGs. That is our plan also with this interaction in the lecture series. Thank you very much, Hakalis. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Van Goomber. So this is the final part of our lecture series session uh, of today. Uh, thank you so much to all the people, all the students and all the audience that will be guiding this interesting lecture today. So the invitation is for the next Wednesday uh, to talk about two important topics in these uh, areas and actions about the SDGs as a task and also as a challenge that we need to achieve uh, in the next eight years. So the first one of the topics could be will be also uh, talking about how do sustainability projects and NGOs benefit from scientific knowledge. And the second one, the migration regimes, violence and mobility, a topic that is uh, totally interesting for the actual and the nowadays dynamic in Colombia and Latin America and also in Germany and Europe. So thank you so much to all the people who will be part of this lecture series. And we are totally, you are totally invited for the next lecture on the next Wednesday. See you.